<laughs> Thanks, Bea, and welcome again, everyone, to this um, webinar, which is uh, evening for me in Australia, but morning for the UK, and um, possibly similar for South Africa, I from memory. But um, in any case, this is intended to be uh, a conversation rather than anything formal vis-a-vis -vis presentation, and so. I'm simply going to introduce um, myself and the journals that I'm interested in and, and, and why very briefly and would like to go around to all the other um, participants to say a similar kind of um, intro and, um, and then when we get a sense of who's in and what they're thinking about with journals uh, then we might have a conversation and I certainly invite both Martin and Karina. Um, having listened to um, all of that, to, to chime in with some uh, reflections and thoughts and any advice or answers. But um, if it, it sort of turns into a more um, to and fro conversation, that's fine. I'm not, not going to be, you know, insistent upon sticking to that format. The main thing is that um, it works for everyone. So, so I'll kick off. So I'm um, Sarah Lambert from Australia, doing a PhD at Deakin and at the, I'm about halfway through a three-year full-time PhD program and starting to think about um, getting some data out of my phase one data collection and the thing that is curious for me is that I'm heading into an interdisciplinary space so although um, I'm certainly uh, there's an, it's an open education PhD I'm interested in the social justice and widening participation agenda and that's very much core to my PhD so I'm looking at things like the International Journal of Widening Participation which of course I've only recently in the last sort of 18 months really gotten up with and wondering about disciplinary journals like that versus your EdTech, JIME and AJET and BJET which I'm very familiar with and then the things that my supervisors are suggesting, which are sort of high-ranking things like the review of educational research. So those are all um, swirling in the mix at the moment. And that's enough from me. So I'm going to turn off my microphone. And if basically anyone would next like to jump in, that would be great. Um, I don't want to be the person who takes over the conversation, but just in case we all do that thing. Um, the ones that we tend to publish... Oh. Lost me. Can people hear me? Okay. Um, I think it dips in and out, so I'll speak slowly. Um, so we tend to publish for uh, OER Hub in um, JIME, uh, Erodl, uh, Eurodl, um, and a couple of others. I'm going to stick in the text box. Um, I, I don't know if any of you list. So um, a few years ago, uh, George Flexianos created a, a, an open Google Doc of open access journals. Um, I was just looking at it, I know it's not been updated for a few years, but of course we're welcome to go and update it, it's an open document. Um, so that's quite a good list of uh, open access ed tech journals that you might want to look through. Um, some other than others, to be honest, but I don't want to, to name any. Um, so that's worth kind of looking through. The thing I was think uh, Sarah touched on is that we tend to publish in Ed tech journals, but sometimes there are journals that are, if you like, peripheral to ed tech, but for which OER, open ed might have a, an application. So there are some about, you know, teaching in higher ed, for instance, would be one. Um, and I think Bayer can talk about having published some of those. Um, sorry, another journal we're publishing is Open Praxis. So that's also a good journal. Um, and so sometimes it depends what your subject is about, you know. So if you're looking at OERs, um, you know, for use in maths education, then there might be a journal of maths education where you can publish as well. So it doesn't always have to be a, an ed tech journal. Um, 
I'll stop now, and I, but I think an issue we'll probably come back to is the whole open access discussion as well. But I'll let someone else speak. Hi, this is Rob. Um, just picking up on that point, I would say one of the um, sort of considerations that we've had with uh, publishing stuff for OER Hub is exclusively publish in open access journals and journals about open education, uh, which has the advantage of a kind of purity um, to it um, and um, maintaining a, a sort of uh, a line on the whole thing where you say we only do this on a matter of principle. Um, but the sort of complication from that is partly you might miss out on good public publication opportunities in other journals because of a special issue or something. Um, but also you have the um, the problem of only sort of preaching to the choir. So you're only reaching the people who are already interested in open education, whereas uh, sometimes publishing in a more kind of traditional education journal can be a way to expose people to just the sort of concept of open education and kind of put it put it in their face again, I suppose. Um, so that's something to to think about, I think. Well, I might thank you for that. Um, I think the impact, the question of impact and the possibility of spreading the, the impact of open ed into other areas is something um, particularly why I'm interested in, um, in those interdisciplinary approaches and, and trying journals that are uh, related to research that, that sort of stretching out of the, the, the core of edtech but some of these are also starting to be open access so it's quite exciting because it does change so frequently but let, let adrian are you ready to um give us a bit of a spiel about um where you're up to and journals that you've kind of relied on or interested in so far Getting a response. Um, well, yes. What, what about let's? Um, yeah. What about Penny? I'm encouraging either Penny or Adrian or Adrian has uh, dropped from the list. I Adrian has know. dropped. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm happy. I'm happy to just um, um, compliment what um, um, Robin Martin was saying in terms of yes, I also uh, prefer and you know I I'm in favor of um, open access journals for to use on my work and also to um, to publish and now uh, working from home away from the university proxy i i um, understand what lack of um, resources means so i am relying uh, more heavily now on open, open access journals and um, and of course giving priority to publishing there but Penny here, just checking if my audio is coming through okay. Yes, it's great. Um, we'd love to oh. love to hear from you. Oh, Tell us what thanks, you're up to. Sam. Oh yeah, um, well I've got a fairly dodgy internet connection, so it may come and go. Um, I'm in the third year of my PhD research uh, through the University of Southern Queensland. I live in Victoria, so I'm a fully distance education student. Um, and mine is cross-disciplinary as well. I, I'm coming from a, um, a secondary education teacher background, so I haven't 
I've come from a teaching background and my interest is in um, merging, it, it crosses adult education, teacher professional learning, STEM education and online education. So I'm approaching professional learning through, through, the, through the point of view of adult education, which is not often done. Um, and so looking at um, a group of teachers who are fairly progressive in what they're doing online and um, trying to find out um, the impact of their professional learning, what, what is meaningful to them uh, through the lens of phenomenography. So I've just, just about come through my data analysis. So in the next six months or so, I hope to get my full um, draft going and um, have that in for, for serious checking and looking over. So um, apart from the journals that have been mentioned already, I, I've been hanging around sort of looking at the adult education journals and I'm particularly interested in transformative learning. So taking a, a sort of a critical look at STEM education and, and adult education and um, seeing what teachers are learning online and, and how they're doing it. So there's some great, great um, uh, narratives that I've got from 20 teachers and I'd love to tell the world about those stories but I but I can't yet until I've sort of written it up and um, got some definite meaning from all of it but some, there's some amazing things happening out there that that um, I don't think people are terribly aware of what some teachers are actually doing there and it's interesting the last last week or so I've been listening to this um, debate around open pedagogy and and um, the focus on curriculum or the focus on self and all this kind of thing. But I'm finding that um, some really interesting things about the, um, rather than the porous um, uh, walls that we've been talking about, but more sort of permeable. I've, I've found teachers that are actually, um, they might be having a trouble, having some trouble in their coding classroom or their science classroom they need some help then and there, and so they're jumping onto their network and bringing, bringing the expert into the classroom while they're teaching. So they're getting professional learning through open education while they're teaching. And they're also taking their classes out to, to experts in uh, universities and other schools to talk to scientists and so on, um, actually while they're teaching. So the teachers are gaining professional learning in practice with their students. Also finding out that a lot of their learning too is quite serendipitous, it's not planned. Um, there's a lot of amazing things that are happening out there that are, uh, are the result of this sort of random, um, the time they spend online and, and who they're with and their, their serendipitous connections. Uh, um, fair bit of it's reflective learning too, um, teachers that like to not so much um, they're learning on social media without being social. So they're, 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 they're learning um, the camaraderie. That they're, they're seeing that other teachers are feeling like crap or, or are having trouble with their kids, but they're not, not keen at this moment to actually join in, but they're learning a lot and, and gaining a fair bit of confidence by watching the conversations that are going on, especially with the ed chats and things like that. Um, so that's, that's been really interesting too. So, wow, that sounds really cool. cool. Yeah. Can I ask you what ask journals what you're reading? reading? Um, well, the ones that have been mentioned already. Um, the, the Journal of Transformative Learning is, I've been finding really useful because that covers, so to con consider adult education, uh, no, I'm sorry, consider professional learning through the transformative learning lens um, blends nicely with STEM education because um, you know, science, technology, energy and maths to me is, is a lot more than um, building robots and uh, 3D printing, that's that kind of thing. And, and um, so learning, bringing together the critical aspects of science education, learning about the planet and sustainability and, and problems like that and then combining that with um, adult education, it's, it's been quite useful. Um, so STEM, the science education journals, um, just to find out what what teachers are actually um, 
you know, the approach that STEM education is taking in schools. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of any, any particular ones off the top of my hat. Um, the Australian Journal of Adult Education um, and the Australian Journal of Science Education, that'd be two. Have I said enough? <laughs> That's really, really, really neat. And I can see that Glenda's been typing. Glenda. So maybe, Glenda, you Glenda. might want to chime in. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn my mic off then. Thanks, Judy, Sarah. thanks, Penny. Penny. No worries. Oh, we have. We've we've lost quite a few. So yes, so Kaina, do you want to chime in? Um, can can you anyone hear me? Okay, um, hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to second what Rob said earlier around the opportunity for reaching new um, audiences or moving across or out of um, primarily open educational research based journals and um, looking at the kind of discipline specific as well and I think that can help for um, if you're doing blabbing as well. So yes, Glenda, I've, I've published in distance education um, and that was that was a special issue following um, the ICDE conference in 2015 um, and so looking out for special issues and calls. But um, I did have one sort of request or question really around um, uh, I, the team and I here, um, in terms of MOOCs, we're thinking of publishing some of the sort of MOOC research coming out, and I'm a little bit wary of, of, of to, you know, putting it into uh, open education journals, partly because of people's um, impressions or uh, thoughts about MOOCs. So, any any thoughts there? Um, and also, I'm looking around at um, places to think about. Uh, uh, research around assessment and if there are any open access journals that are to do with e-assessment, um, online assessment and in particular kind of peer peer assessment. So a bit of a request and just comment to second what Rob was saying about um, getting out there more. I think that's all I've got to say. spoken mainly about journal papers so far um, and in a way there's still the kind of, um, the sort of indispensable um, output um, if you're in an academic environment. Um, one thing I'd note about that is that uh, we sort of experience a certain amount of pressure to publish in sort of prestige journals which are rarely open access um, and that you know gives us kind of a tension <laughs> which we have to sort of work with all the time. Uh, to try and um, get the balance right. Um, but I was just going to say that there are other so-called non-traditional um, ways of publishing research. So some of the things that we've done include writing an open course and kind of or creating a MOOC and putting it out there, making data sets available online, blogging about projects sort of as you're going along. Um, so I wonder if people thought about these kind of sort of alternative dissemination models. Uh, if people can hear me, um, that's a point I was going to make as well, Rob. I think. Um, 
and it's kind of related open access um, argument and I, I fully accept sometimes in some countries um, in order to get tenure for example you have to certain journals and it's you know that's what you have to do and I think it's it's not beholden on me to say you must publish open access but um, there are as well as just kind of ethically I think there are a number of reasons to publish open access when I say publish open access remember that can all include the going down the green route and putting a version in um, uh, a repository but one of the things about open access is this being able to reach different audiences so um, it's very difficult for Um, but also just being able to things as Rob mentioned so whenever you do a, an article then do an accompanying blog post that kind of explains it perhaps in, 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 in more in the kind of too long didn't read style and, so, and it also allows you to talk about it in, in a different type of language um, but also people do things like you know, nice infograph summarize their, um, uh, their article and you can fairly easy packages or um, I saw a really nice video that uh, someone had done of uh, George Valetzianis' recent day. So it allows you to do kind of other things that will help you reach some of those different audiences as well. So um, I think it's worth considering the kind of almost like a, an, an ecosystem around an article that allows you to, to push it out. Um, I didn't hear. I I'm not sure whether we've gone all silent. Um, Martin, stop it now. Can I just speak? I, I know it, it, instead of just going in many different directions. Um, can we just briefly just um try and answer Sukaina's uh, question? So, um, about the e-assessment journals, I don't. I, I must confess, I don't. I don't really know. But I googled it, and that's that's what I came up with. Uh, Sukaina's. But I don't really know if if they're open access or what, or what's the quality of of, of that. What um, I'm. Can we just address the question? So um, what you actually. I think you could still target any educational technology uh, journal, even if they're not. You know, the 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 debate whether MOOCs are open or not open should should not stop you from publishing in any of the on uh, the the ed tech journals or even you know the, just go for for discipline. Um, oh God, that's all. I think I want to signal here properly. Hello, the, the audio is dropping. Okay, um, looks like, yeah, we, uh, just on Bayer's point, going back to Sukana's point, then, um. If, if everyone else wants to die, feel free. Uh, I think I, I, I get some of your um, reticence, Sukaina. Um, I think sometimes we 
the, the, the kind of MOOC backlash has made people think <laughs> you know, that's not for us and this is only pure OER type papers. Um, but I think a lot of those journals we mentioned would still publish interesting stuff about um, MOOCs. Um, research is also in a lot of the kind of computer science type education journals as well where it's really talking about kind of working with data and analytics and those kind of things so it depends what type of MOOC research you're doing um, so but I think a lot of people are interested in the kind of more qualitative type of research as well now so um, so all those those journals we've mentioned I think would publish interesting MOOC papers that have qualitative research but equally, there's kind of the more kind of computers and education type ones, which are more focused on the kind of analytics. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, that um, I suppose it's just um, taking a strategic approach and seeing where the um, MOOC, you know, what it is the MOOC um, research is focusing on. And um, Glenda's just walked into my office, um, so she now can hear and we can hear her if she wants to say anything. Hi, everyone. Uh, for some reason, um, what, 10, 15 meters down the corridor, the signal is better at UCT. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that's all about. Maybe I'm in the shadow of the mountain, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I made my point earlier that I'm going to try for distance education. I think it's quite a strategic move for me because I'd like to publish something from my PhD. Um, so it's a recognized journal um, and at least it does have some um, open access options in terms of pre and post prints. So I always find Sherpa Romeo a really good place to go and just check to see what's going on. Um, so that's kind of all I really wanted to say, but that's what I'm thinking of. And I suppose it gets to what to Rob's point about um, extending the audience out and trying to get our message out a little bit. Thanks. Um, Penny has, hello everyone, I think you can hear me. Penny uh, and I have suggested the, the directory of open access journals where you can actually, actually search for open access journals that um, um, in different disciplines, um, subjects, and you can also um, um, check what type of open access is, if it's gold, if it's um, which license the journal has, and if even if they charge. So that's quite a um, useful um, place, like a portal with um, with the open access journals there. Um, well, yeah, that, but there are um, Glenda. Uh, other um, open access um, uh, journals like Arodo that is also have an excellent reach and um, and good ratings too for 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 us in Australia in terms of you know what institutions expect in terms of what type of uh, journals we have to publish because then like Martin and and, and Robin. Uh, uh, Rob, sorry, has um, they have um, um, said that you know we are we work for an institution that wants us to publish in certain journals, but then our audience and the people we work with and the people we want to reach, the readers we want to reach, are in different read different uh, 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 journals. So we kind of have the balance that we know we have to publish to get the the points, but we also have to. At least that's that's when I find myself many times. Another way sometimes we could uh, take advantage of, uh, you know, get the work that we have to the people we want to read um, is through maybe special issues. Some journals have special issues uh, books, so it's, it would be good to keep an eye on um, all these publications when they come up. We recently had one from Rory. There was a special issue in, let's see here, I have some notes. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, received it, uh, but it, it's a shame that it closed yesterday. Um, in the, I'll put it here, 
just people want to see. I think it is also an, um, an open access journal. I think this is our open access um, journal that is education in general. But I think this was a special issue. It's pretty, it's closed. But um, we, we, yeah, we. It's good to keep an eye on those opportunities. Anybody else? Uh, well, I've got a message up saying that I have an unstable connection, so I'm wondering if people can, uh, whether I'm getting through okay. Yes, all oh good. Um, as a PhD student, I'm, I'm getting mixed messages about um, what I can put out there, how much of my data I can safely put out there before my work has been examined. and. Um, you know, I'm just wondering whether there's any any uh, advice that people have about um, if I'm if I'm not presenting at a a, a conference or a, a seminar or anything like that. You know, um, these more informal ways of, of chatting about our research, like such as what Martin mentioned before about blogs and um, putting it out in those more informal spaces. Um, uh, we're at risk in any way of putting our data and our ideas out there before our work has been examined and is it best to wait until afterwards? Does anyone have an opinion about that? I can. can you hear me okay? Um, hi Penny, uh, I, mean, I don't want to say anything that would contradict your supervisors, <laughs> so um, whatever I say, you know, uh, there are lots of caveats around it, but generally I think people like to see publications that have come out of, um, of PhDs, by the time we get there it kind of shows that the one of the questions as an examiner you get asked is, is there material in this PhD that's worthy of publication? So if someone's already been published, then that answers that question very positively. So um, it's not usually an issue to publish your to publish papers out of your research, and often it's kind of a way you build up. So uh, people like to think that they can have sort of one or two publications by the time you get to the to the viva. I mean, if your concern is in a way all of your data now before you've had a chance to write it up, that's that, that's a different issue. And if you're scared that someone will um, pinch your data and do work with it, um, then I can understand uh, that concern. But but generally sort of publishing is is to be recommended and um, and it wouldn't have any detrimental effects on all on your PhD. And certainly that's the position uh, in, in UK and Europe. I am just. Um, I remember when I was doing my PhD, I found it really, really hard to actually publish, to write for anything that wasn't my PhD. In a sense, um, I was never really encouraged by my supervisors to publish uh, during my PhD. Really, they they always said to me, "Well, wait until you finish, and then when you finish." Um, go for it, you know, and then what happened was that I finished it and I got my PhD and then I went straight into working into something else. I mean, there's bits and pieces here and there, you know, the publication with, with other people. So, um, I th it's, 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 it's kind of a difficult situation, I think. It's very much, you see, how prolific are you at writing and can you keep the the two things going at the same time, as in writing your dissertation and writing for publication. Um, um, for me, I, I mean, from personal experience, it was actually quite quite difficult. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you, Bia. Um, it's very tricky and it will depend on Penny's deadline as well. So um, if she is about to um, have her final write-up to submit, when is again Penny late in the year or in six months or eight months? It depends on how much time you have to concentrate on writing um, papers um, out of that. But perhaps an approach would be, you know, if you want to write out of a PhD. And I did like you, Bia. I, uh, <laughs> I was, um, I, I presented a couple of times where I really never had a paper, a good paper out of my PhD until the end, and then it was too late because they get, you get into work and, and other outcomes from what you're doing. It's hard to go back. Um, but an, an alternative, it could be why you are doing your PhD, you can publish steps of it. You can show to them to the examiners, like Martin was saying, that um, this has already been peer reviewed um, at different stages. For example, you can publish about the methodology. You can then um, have your data in a preliminary analysis. You can publish the findings of your preliminary analysis if you don't want to put it out everything out there. Um, yeah, just just some um, strategies that you can slowly um, publish, you know, bits and pieces um, before you get into the final write-up. I think because once you you are into that type of writing, it's different. It's um, it's different than have to stop and focus on a small paper which is only ten pages of your whole work. See, I, I think what well, see one of the things to, to one of the messages to take away is like really the more you write, the better it is for you, and the more public exposure you have, the better it's always gonna be for you as well. Um, I wish you know if I had if I went back to my PhD, I and and I was very lucky in the sense that I got a grant to do my PhD, so I was doing I was doing a bit of uh, work on the side, but it was kind of related to my PhD, so. Um, if if I could go back, I would definitely uh, write more about it, uh, not necessarily for for a publication in a journal, but I would have, you know, I would have kept some kind of a diary or or, or a blog or something. See, but the fact that I was never encouraged to do that, it's just that it probably never even crossed my my mind to be that to be that public. So that's one of the things that I would encourage everyone to do. And in fact, it kind of goes back to Rob's point. Um, um, you know, just get get your research out there, even if it's okay. If it is like a publication in 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 a in a journal, that's that's great. But if if you're not able for that because of time constraints or whatever, you, you know, I think blogging is one of the things that I would have that I would have liked to do, and that's one of the things I would recommend now. Penny is just jumping in again. I said I just typed in about how I've had a blog that's been on the go for years because I've used that for my teacher's registration in Australia um, as evidence of uh, reflecting on my practice. I, I'm not a classroom teacher anymore. But, oh, look, I've got quite a few blog posts sort of on the go, but I... I'm just so reluctant to put it out there. I, not coming from an academic background, I keep putting pressure on myself that, oh, no, this isn't good enough, no one's going to want to hear it. But I, I also keep reading that um, that's the best place to start to, to practice my academic writing. So um, I think I'd better get stuck into it. So maybe that's a good place for me to start. Thank you. 
what kind what kind, what kind of advice uh yeah i'm i mean i'm not i'm if you want advice from from a blogger you're gonna have to ask martin karina because he's, he's definitely the best of all of us here and definitely much better than me anyway but um so i'm just if we it's it's basically quarter to eleven here in the in I was gonna say in the UK but I'm actually in Ireland. Um um what so what advice so we've we've talked about uh, journals and we've gone for open access or discipline specific or open or just uh, distance education. So what but what advice would we have for uh, PhD students in terms of in terms of writing and in terms of, of publishing? Uh, just, just as uh, if everyone can hear me again, just as um, a journal editor, one thing I would say is this may sound obvious, <laughs> but read the journal's guidelines about what the, the type of articles they're after, um, and, and a very obvious stuff about the format and stuff like that. But we quite often get articles coming into Giant which are obvious. Um, so sometimes they deep mismatch and just a waste of time, but other times I think, well, with a bit more effort, they could have been geared more to us. Oh, no sound. Can anyone hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, so just. Um, you know, to look at what the journal's after and make sure you gear it towards them because sometimes the same article can be applicable to different journals but you might need to just kind of tweak the even just the abstract induction to kind of make it seem more apparent that it's applicable to them um, don't just fire stuff off I think um, and, and work closely with what the journal's after and I think as we've said before really look for special issues um, I wouldn't want to suggest that special issues have a kind of lower threshold for acceptance, but that they are looking for particular types of articles. So, um, and often they've got a deadline. So, if, if you're, if, you've, if they're looking for, you know, articles about OE, open textbooks or something, and you've got an article about open textbook, then you know you stand a, a probably a slightly better chance of being accepted than just a, a an open call. So, uh, definitely special issues are worth chasing. Um, can I also um, um, mention that there are certain journals like this one here that I'm putting the Journal of Learning for Development. I had a talk to Asha. This is the Commonwealth of Learning. Um, so I had a ta uh, talk with Asha and um, Sanjaya, the, one of the editors, and they were actually saying that um, they, I don't think this is a very, um, this journal has a very high ratings. But it is kind of a start to help early career researchers um, from all over the world. So perhaps a way to start to and have that first, if you haven't had it yet, you know, that first um, round of revision and, um, and, and, you know, help to go through all these complexities, perhaps um, it could be a way to go too. It's just open praxis is also another journal from my CDE. It's open access that um, they are willing to go through some, um, you know, mentoring process and helping um, to help writers um, to get through. That's just some um, a tip there. Yeah.
I don't know if I'm coming through again, but just to um, uh, on that point, Karina raises about impact factor. That's that's a very interesting one because um, we mentioned kind of the status of the journal and people think they have to publish in high impact um, journals, and and it's have a few of them in your CV, and there are certainly some journals. If you're publishing them, people look at them and think, well, they accept anything, and that doesn't always work very well for you if that's the only places you've published. But the impact factor is less significant than it used to be. So um, in the UK, we have the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, and they claim they don't look at the research, uh, the, the impact factor of the journal. I'm not sure how true that is, but that's what sort of, they claim. They're looking at the impact and, and the quality of the particular article, not where it's published. And that becomes increasingly true with social media and if you're publishing open access. And as long as it's published in a reasonable journey, not one of these kind of pay to publish ones that will publish anything. But um, if it's published in a reasonable academic journal, then you are your brand in a way. You know, So you've got a network and you get to disseminate it um, and you push it out through various means. And, and that can drive the... And citation advantage, you get higher citations in open access journals. And if you've got a good online network, then you know, pushing it out through that will, will certainly increase your uh, citations and impact. So the journal is still important, but not as important as it used to be. So it's worth considering some of these other ones. Don't dismiss them just because they haven't got an impact factor of, of X. Thanks for that, Martin. Um, I'm so glad that it, that's what it is now. Um, you know, that's the the trend in the UK that um, you know the the impact factors are not as considered as it used to be. Uh, because here in Australia, the pressure we are under is just horrendous. And being in an area of <laughs> that we 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 encourage open access journals and we encourage research and, and open research, you know, it's really hard to go against the metrics um, and the ratings or the, the, the impact factor. So um, I'm so glad it's, things are changing. So there is hope for us down under here then because we tend to follow some of the trends in the UK. So that's good news for us. Yeah, but if we, it's terrible. Um, even university funding um, is relying on the types of journals we publish, funding for research. It's terrible. Well, actually, I actually don't. I don't think we need some of that for the CVs. Yeah, but um, it, there, it's a lot of pressure because then for us, you miss that opportunity to actually reach the people you would like to read our work, the ones that need it the most that are you know, outside of the university proxy, uh, but also our colleagues that tend to use paid journals. Hello, people, can you hear me? Oh, 
Okay, it's just a mix. I think we, we lost, what happened was that we lost Karina's sound while she was speaking and then we all we all went silent. So that's why, why nobody is, 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 hearing, uh, is hearing anything. So we, we're getting close to the hour. So um, do I have a uh, last few words from Sarah maybe? That's Penny here. My audio seems to be not wanting to connect, so I may be speaking into the void. Um, oh, I've forgotten what I was going to say. Um, oh yeah, journals, uh, journals that reach teachers is a quite a, f a fair bit of discussion around about um, teachers needing to be more in touch with um, what's going on in research. So uh, I like a more informal way of writing, but Apparently that's not acceptable enough for my PhD, so that's the kind of thing I'm trying to get my my uh, writing around now is to is to um, make it. Oh, I can't even say it, is to try not to be too formal, but but to write it in a in a language that's going to be accessible, and that that's um that's a real skill I think, and uh, that's why I love reading blogs because there's some fabulous bloggers out there who've just got the gift, and that's what I'm working towards. Uh, sorry, it's Martin here. I think you're right, Sarah. Are you still there, Sarah? Um, and I think that's why you sometimes need to do both of those things. Kind of have a um, have a have a paper that's written in that kind of formal language, but then you can do a company in blog, perhaps a bit more approachable. Okay, I think I'm going to wrap it up. Um, it could be the case that Sarah, I don't know whether you can speak or not. So um, I, I was I just, it's a picture, well, I was just kind of thinking that's the other thing that's in who do you write with is also a very interesting topic, but maybe we'll leave it for um, a second conversation sometime soon. Um, uh, thanks everybody for taking part. Thank you, Sarah, for for organizing. Thank you, Karina and Martin, for for being here, and everybody else. Um, uh, we'll put up the recording as soon as as soon as I can. And uh, uh, don't forget, next week we'll be here all over again with the Open Math team. So if anyone wants to wants to come along, that that that'd be great. If not. You know, as usual, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have, if you need anything, just drop, drop me a line, uh, send me a tweet, send me an email, and uh, we'll get things going. So, okay, this is it. Thank you very much, everybody.